we're going to focus on on one area of the US justice system, one of the most inhumane um, and one one issue that really is at odds with human rights, and that's the death penalty. Um, in the US, we've we've executed children, we've executed intellectually disabled people, we've intellectual, uh, we, we've executed physically disabled people. Um, one execution has to take place with an inmate seated because he was physically incapable of lying down. Um, we've executed mentally ill people. Um, in my former home state of Texas, uh, we executed a man who represented himself at trial wearing a purple cowboy suit and tried to subpoena Jesus. Um, We've refused mercy to people um, who have undergone serious personal change, um, and we have executed innocent people. Um, we've executed people whose lawyers have barely shown up for trial. Uh, people have gone to death row with drunk lawyers and sleeping lawyers. Um, and, and worst of all is we have filled death rows across the country with disproportionately high populations of, of people of color. Um, Personally, for many years defending death penalty cases, this session um, def defending people facing death penalty cases, I guess I should be really clear on that. Um, this session is, is very important to me. Um, and I'm really grateful to be joined um, by some incredible um, colleagues on this call. We're gonna be talking to Colleen Picard, who is the ethical campaigns lead for Lush Cosmetics. Um, Christopher Miller, who is the head of global activism uh, strategy at Ben and Jerry's, and um, Kwame Ajamu, who is the chairman of Witness to Innocence. So let's uh, let's jump in, Kwame. If you are able to turn on your camera and your microphone, um, we would love to see you. And I'm going to send the first question to you. Um, Kwame, can I start with you, and we'll talk a little bit about um, about your story and your organization's work on the death penalty. Uh, certainly. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me pretty good? I can hear you perfectly, my friend. Thank you. Um, let me first say that it is uh, always a pleasure and uh, a personal joy of mine to uh, come out and speak against capital punishment and its ills. I want to say also that uh, uh, Colleen Packard is uh, a very sweet lady and a dear, kind friend of mine, and so it's always a pleasure to be uh, in her uh, immediate. Okay, um, guys, I know we've pressed for time, so I'm going to jump right into it for you. Uh, I am a, a um, man who was um, a boy child of 17 years old, wrongfully convicted of uh, murder and sentenced to die at the tender age of 17. Uh, here in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, which uh, foolishly I still live. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, I live here because uh, there is work to be done in the abolition movement. Um, it took me 28 years of actual incarceration and 39 years uh, to uh, actually free myself and my brother and my good friend from uh, the bonds of wrongful incarceration. I want you to know that I went through these elements uh, alone and uh, frustrated as a boy. Uh, I was educated and raised in the state of Ohio. I received all of my education as such. I went on to be an educationer, um, facility, uh, facilitator myself, and as I worked for the administration for 21 years, being the administrative clerk of the education department. Uh, as such, I helped them to um, illustrate what education was all about by putting in uh, three, four, five classes, and then finally the NAACP would be the last of uh, my battles within the, the correctional facilities. I say all this because it is important to have a, a base touch with the community, even though I was in, uh, incarcerated. I knew that uh, there would be an element of, of uh, surprise once they knew that uh, this innocent man had a plan also to educate and uh, stop folks from uh, if they could continue in a, a nonviolent way or if they could not uh, continue as such. But through education, I knew this would help. Having uh, uh, obtained my freedom, I come into uh, Witness the Innocence um, 2014 was when uh, we were exonerated, uh, November of 2014, and also when I became a uh, foot soldier in uh, the struggle with Witness to Innocence. 
Uh, I would climb the ranks very quickly uh, because of so many different ideologies that I had and ideals uh, to propel the organization. As I firmly believe that men and women who have suffered the personal atrocities of having been sentenced to die and surviving that uh, ordeal should be the first and foremost in this regiment against capital punishment. And so it is my uh, hope and plan to continue uh, having witness the innocence be at the forefront of all of our uh, uh, fighting towards the ending of capital punishment. Uh, it is uh, really near and dear to me that we go into the communities and uh, with this understanding that they kind of shelter, um, or should I say foster a better understanding amongst especially its young, its youth. And uh, the best way to do this, uh, this might uh, be uh, kind of funny to you guys, I thought though would be like a, a, a mob blast. And what I mean by that is uh, being that we're dealing with uh, organizations and businesses um, uh, where I live, uh, I have a few friends that own businesses, and I, it is my intention to get with them uh, this week. I have been was trying, even before we set this up, uh, that we could have like a, a mob setting uh, to come and, you know, not only help propel the business financially, but also to get the word out too. And I think this is a good way to make that uh, community uh, more um, uh, confident, so to say, and come together. Um, the Lush organization has been near and dear to me uh, for so many reasons. Uh, not to just mention uh, the fact that uh, everywhere I've went, uh, I visit the stores, uh, Columbus, Ohio, you know, and all through Cleveland and, and down through, uh, I think, Cincinnati, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I always go and uh, take pictures with uh, the, uh, <laughs> the store, you know, the people in the store, make sure that, uh, you know, we are, are um, greet it and, and let them know that, uh, you know, we are a part of uh, your organization's efforts to help end uh, the capital punishment and also to put a word out there for the uh, human rights part of it all. Because when it all comes down to it, we are human beings. And as such, we should treat each other. And remember that um, for those of us who have the religious uh, incentives that God Almighty has made you from the best of the most. And therefore, we should not throw away that mold simply because we want to be uh, mean-spirited and evil to each other. You know. Um, Chloe, yeah. before, before I turn to Colleen, because I'm going to definitely pick on her next, um, can you just tell us again how many years you spent on death row? So, in 1975, I was uh, sentenced to die, and I went to death row at the tender age of 18. I did three and a half years on death row, actually, and the rest of 25 years of actual uh, incarceration in uh, Lucasville, Lima, and Mansfield Correctional is where I was uh, finally paroled from. Uh, my exoneration did not come through the system, uh, parole system I had to go through. Yeah. 28 years. 28 so. years all total. I don't know how, Colleen, Chris, I don't know how we even speak after hearing a story of this nature but we must, and this is a conversation about how businesses fix this. I think to be a business that has Kwame come to their shop and hug everybody there means that you've done something pretty special. So Carleen, tell us a little bit about what Lush did, what it's done and, 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 and why it came to make those, those choices. Well, sure, sure. Happy to, Celia, and thanks for, thanks for bringing us into this conversation as well, and um, lovely to share space with the panelists. Um, I'll back up for a sec and just sort of clarify for folks, like, we are absolutely talking about Lush, Lush Cosmetics, the soap company. We make soap. Um, and we are also a campaigning company and feel that we have an important role to play in both creating conversations, but also moving our customers along the um, road with us with our vision of human rights, animal protection and environmental justice. So it certainly was um, news, I think, to Kwame when we came banging on his door and said, you know, we want to learn from you. We want to hear um, your story, we want to know if you're comfortable telling your story to the world and um, and then asked, you know, folks in Witness to Innocence, what would be the best way to do that through 
a soap company um, and through the 250 stores that we had back in 2017. So we, again, launch campaigns in our stores. We um, encourage people to take action and, and very much um, to support the organizations that we're working with. To how we got to that point, um, I think really speaks to the, what, the, you know, the way that Kwame mentioned, um, you know, that we're all human beings. And for as much as people say to us, you know, what does a soap company have to do calling for the abolition of the death penalty in the United States? You know, we respond back that we're we're certainly a company, but we're a company of people, and we're a company of people that really care, and that um, the old adage of the death penalty: the more you learn about it, the less you like it, absolutely rang true to our seven thousand staff at that time. So, you know, we um, by taking the time, by understanding that the question about fairness, the question about justice, the the question about all of the you know, all of the issues of the criminal justice system that you mentioned at the, at the top of this, Celia, when, once we learned all of those things, and you know, that can take a bunch of time on one end, or you can also just like get it really quickly. You know, you can watch a couple of films, you can read Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, and, um, and it, it, it can just land. So, you know, we, we took those steps and then as a company, you know, became abolitionists and um, also put that out into the world and, and continue to do so. Chris, from, from soap to ice cream, two of my favorite things. Um, let's talk a little bit about what Ben & Jerry's has done because, you know, there's a lot of similarities between you guys and Lush and I think, you know, Ben Kerr and Jerry, Jerry Greenfield kind of see business as a vehicle to, to, to campaign and, and, and promote um, sort of a human rights. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you guys did around the death penalty, how you guys came there and, uh, and, and what the outcome of that was. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say thanks, Celia, for, for having me and how um, honored I am to, to share the virtual stage with Carlene and, and Kwame. Um, you know, as you noted, we were, you know, founded 42 years ago by two guys, Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, sort of counterculture uh, guys who decided they wanted to start a company because they like to eat and hang out together. Um, sort of three years into the company, it sort of occurred to Ben that he had become sort of what he loathed in society, a business guy. And uh, uh, he and Jerry came incredibly close to selling the company. And, and Ben had a mentor who was a restaurateur and, and his friend Maurice said to Ben, you can't sell this company, it's your baby. You've created this incredible thing. If you don't like the way businesses are run, change the way you run your business. And it was sort of at that moment that Ben realized that the purpose of Ben and Jerry's was not just so that he could hang out with Jerry and eat, but that it could be a vehicle to advance progressive social change. And, and that sort of set us on a path that leads us to where we are today, specifically as it relates to issues around the criminal justice system and the death penalty. Uh, in 2015, at our annual company gathering where we have representatives from the 300 scoop shops around the country uh, and, and corporate staff, our co-founders, Ben and Jerry, are given an opportunity to address the company. And, Ben uh, introduced us to a, a gentleman by the name of Brian Ferguson, who has a story very similar to, to Kwame's. Uh, and he was, in fact, a cousin of a member of the Ben & Jerry's Board of Directors. Uh, in 2002, Brian was a student uh, in West Virginia, and he was arrested, he was tried, he was convicted for a homicide that he didn't commit. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and spent the next 12 years of his life uh, uh, fighting for his freedom. It was at that meeting that Ben suggested that if, in fact, we were a company uh, that was committed to issues of racial and social justice, it was incumbent upon us to take on this system. And I think, you know, there is a big opportunity for a, a company like ours uh, 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 to, to influence this debate, both with policymakers and with consumers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a really good segue into, you know, a conversation about what needs to change kind of at a policy level and, and what this feels like to communities, right, to those consumers. You know, we, we've talked about human rights, we've talked about the justice system, and we've talked about the death penalty. And I think one of the things that's really clear for me to me for this conversation is that 
these are, this is one, this is one conversation. These are the same, these are three sides of the same coin. If you can have a three, three sided coin, which I think you probably can't, but this is all one conversation. Right. And I think we're seeing this in America now, um, you know, in the time that I have been working on this, I don't think I could possibly imagine that we would be seeing the levels of support that we're seeing from Republicans, that we're seeing um, bipartisan bills, um, successful places like New Hampshire and Colorado, um, that support is coming from places, uh, support for abolition, I should say, is coming from places that, um, that are kind of newer and, and growing. Um, and, and I think that's, that's partly, you know, a recognition that it's wrong with Colleen and Chris, I, I'd love to kind of unpack some other reasons why, but before we move on to that, like Kwame, I'd love to talk about that community level, you know, how, let's start at that social and community level. Um, how is the death penalty felt at the community level? That, um, well, I'll just um, use uh, myself, uh, family case history, and uh, you can, Imagine, um, when I went to prison at the age of 17 years old, um, everybody in the community was shocked and amazed uh, that, uh, you know, not that it happened, crimes always happen, but that I guess we were sentenced to die, right? And then, you know, came the innocent part. But uh, the shock factor of us being sentenced to die was, was very great. Um, personally, uh, doing this, um, uh, encounter with uh, the sentence of death. Uh, I, I did meet uh, the loss of family members, uh, six aunties, three uncles, my grandfather. Um, my oldest brother died two months before I was actually released from prison. Uh, but what I'm trying to show you is that on the other side of, of the person who was sentenced to die is what happens to the family, what happens within the community, uh, how um, for instance, my mom was a very religious person, went to church and donated her monies to the church. And so how she went in shame, you know, of not one, but two boys being sentenced to die uh, wrongfully. Um, I just spoke with a, a girl, a woman now, but she was a little neighbor girl that used to go over to my mom's house. And she told me, she said that, uh, she said, your mother told me that uh, she never, ever gave up hope that you guys would be free, you know, and your names would be cleared. You know, and so this this woman now is like 60 years old herself telling me this story. We just talked like last week, uh, but the impact of, of, of that of that uh, atrocity is still felt very much so in the community. And, and the fact that um, now I'm here trying to deliver some type of uh, peaceful understanding to that same community that they can understand and not go forward. Uh, also that I have uh, workshops going into the judicial system working with, uh, which is the uh, uh, accuracy and justice programming that I have uh, through Witness the Innocence, uh, speaking with uh, the prosecution that they could uh, forge a better understanding even before wrongful incarceration and, and mass incarceration starts. And so, you know, we're working very hard behind the shadows and we're hoping that because of the strong impact that I know it has had on my community and my family, and now 50 years later, you know, um, that is still there, you know, and, and we can work. Yeah, it's very, very, very prevalent in the community. And before we move on to talking a little bit, thank you for sharing that, Kwame, you know, before we move on to talking a little bit about, you know, other kind of policy um, imperatives around the death penalty, like, I want to point out one thing that perhaps people don't always know, of my clients that escape the death penalty, most of them are serving a life without possibility of parole sentence. And for most of them that are serving that sentence, that sentence came out of a result of a plea agreement. Um, and the plea agreement is a fairly uniquely American problem um, where in death penalty cases, you threaten somebody with dying unless they agree to a contract with the prosecution whereby they plead guilty in order to avoid dying. If you entered into a contract to buy a house or a car where you were told you were gonna be killed if you didn't enter into that contract, under civil law, there is no way that contract would stand. Um, but you know, Kwame, I have spent a career working with 18 year olds, 19 year olds that are facing horrible decisions like that. And even if they 
escape the death penalty, let's put it like that, the impact on families and individuals of having to make a decision of that magnitude with those odds on the table is, is as unconscionable, almost as unconscionable as sending people to death row. So thank you so much for sharing that. I want to talk about some of the kind of other, you know, policy imperatives, um, particularly Chris and Colleen, I want to talk a little bit about cost. You know, one of the things that I hear so often is I'm for the death penalty because it's cheaper, which is, which is maybe kind of mind blowing now, but I think a lot of people don't really understand how expensive the death penalty is, you know, heads up as a lawyer, I'd get paid to do that work, right? Like, I, it's not a lot, <laughs> it's a fair plea of poverty, but somebody had to pay me and that would be usually a state or federal government um, or, or a philanthropic organization. And that cost is, is you know, in, in Kwame's case, 28 years of lawyers working for him to realize that a mistake had been made. So let's talk a little bit about cost, you know, especially as we look at post pandemic budgets. Um, why is this, like, why is this argument so important? Like, let's unpack this argument and talk about why it's so important to the movement. Chris, can I start with you on this? Sure. I mean, I think the argument is complete and utter rubbish, right? And I think we, we have to push back at it, against it. And I think we have to put it in the context of the overall justice system. You can't responsibly talk about issues of cost without looking at the system at large. We are 4% of the world's population and we lock up 25% of all incarcerated people on the planet. The costs of this system are immense. I, I, in, in light of recent events, I became aware as someone who's been engaged on these issues for a number of years, that in my own town of Burlington, Vermont, not a place that is teeming with violent crime, fully 25% of our city's budget is spent on policing and the criminal justice system. That's insane. There are great needs in our community and within society. And so the idea that our justice system, particularly as it relates to the death penalty, should be guided by anything other than justice is frankly absurd. And I think particularly as it relates to the issue of cost, it, 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 you can't look at that without looking at the system as a whole and understanding the, the deep costs that the system has on our society and as Kwame so clearly articulated on the communities around the country. Yeah, I'm just seeing some of the, the comments in the chat in Colorado, public safety and costs for incarceration are leading the discussion around justice reform. And that is being led by the executive director of the Department of Corrections. You know, I think one, one of the studies um, that was, I think it was the Philadelphia study put the cost per execution at, at around 270 million per execution. Um, I think, you know, in the current economy and what we're dealing with when we're trying to you know rally around a vaccine or whatever it is, like that's kind of a, a luxury that we we can't really afford at this point. Colleen, can I come to you with the same question, talk a little bit about, you know, what are the cost implications? What are the other arguments that you're seeing that are really gaining traction um, um, in moving in moving the conversation forward about, about the death penalty? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of always point to, um, I mean, I sort of point to the moment when I realized that that working on abolition of the death penalty was actually something you know, was my moment of like where I actually care about this and I actually have to be involved in this and that it was um, impossible to go forward to not see that the death penalty touches everything around us. Um, you know, I had had spent my years working on working on other issues and thought, well, it's, you know, the amazing lawyers like yourself and it's, um, you know, folks that are coming from the faith community or the, you know, that it, it was just an issue that other people were working on and, and didn't need to be something that, you know, I focused on. And I think the, the, the wealth of arguments against the death penalty are the things that are with us and they're the things that, um, 
that <laughs> that are all like I think Chris was saying like all on our side um, mm -hmm. to be able to you know we've heard about um, you can talk about the costs with people that really care about costs you can talk about the unfairness um, to people who you know want to say well the death penalty doesn't happen in my region sure but it happens you know disproportionately to black folks in the south like does that seem like it's fair um, that you might have the death penalty in one state and have a punishment for a certain crime and then you don't have the death penalty in another state. Like again, that, that issue of fairness is something that we also see really works with people. Of course, the issue of exoneration um, is, is a piece that is incredibly important to talk to about people. And I would say within our company, um, for folks that were um, maybe concerned about coming to talk about the death penalty um, it, in a lot of cases were the, you know, that had been, had been like me and didn't know much about it. Um, but the, that learning piece to really talk about how it's unconscionable to kill somebody in a, that is innocent and how that kind of concept of there's no taking it back. I mean, the earth would certainly be a less great place if Kwame was not on it with us today. Um, I think that the that issue um, and the way that Kwame speaks to that, you know, the question about community impact is incredibly important as well. And it's why, you know, I would say the work of Witness to Innocence is so important um, because being an organization dedicated to formerly incarcerated, exonerated folks um, allows those stories to come forward. And, 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 you know, not, I don't just say that because the, the stories get your heart. Um, but because practically there is no way to stare somebody who spent time on death row in the face and say that you still think the death penalty is, is some sort of form of justice. So I have always said, you know, I feel like the moment I became an abolitionist and the moment I you know, got to talk to folks in Lush and our customers about why being an abolitionist was so exciting is you get to welcome in a wonderful amount of people who are just incredible and, and working every day. Um, but also because it's the right thing to do. Um, it's the right thing for a company to be an abolitionist company. Um, there's no downside to it. There's no downside in this day and age to being bold and to um, being open to speaking to folks and, and wanting to change not just hearts, but minds and seeing real wins in some of the states that we have seen um, are incredible moments of, of pride to have been part of that. I think that number one, let's take a second to shout out Witness to Innocence because it's, it's an amazing organization um, and I it's do. horrifying that we have an organization that is entirely created, you know, entirely consists of and dedicated to a community of people who have innocent, have been innocent on death row. Like it's a terrible thing that an organization like Witness to Innocent is even capable of existing, but how amazing is the work of Witness to Innocence? So thank you for calling that out. Colleen, I want to stay with you a little bit and invite you, Chris, to kind of jump in here. You know, Lush and Ben and Jerry's are amazing companies and, you know, perhaps to some businesses have a sort of standard and ethical hygiene that is almost sort of, you know, unattainable. How do we get, other, how do we work together to get other businesses to see what you've seen uh, around, around the death penalty and to, and to care about this issue? Colleen, I'm gonna stick with you and put you right on the spot. And then Chris, I'm gonna to come to you with the same question. I think that, yeah, you know, for me, businesses are, um, you know, businesses are fortunate though organizations, you know, like yours exists. The, the toolkit um, that exists is really just a starting place um, for businesses to have a look, you know, sort of test out, like, how does this, uh, you know, how, how does the death penalty sort of impact us as a company? And I think that the toolkit that RBJI has um, can can help start some real conversations. I mean, I think what I always say is that, you know, each company has their own way that they work. Um, I, you know, the, the position that I'm in at Lush allows me to look at issues that I think are important um, in the progressive social justice community. We sometimes will talk about issues that we're, um, you know, that, that will sort of test with our audiences, we'll be like, you know, do our audiences like this? But, you know, once we take a stand on something, we stick with it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking about other businesses that have been able to 
um, take a stand or, or talk about the death penalty, whether it's on an individual case, um, you know, in a certain state that you might be, whether or not it's, you know, talking to states about, you know, not wanting to expand into a state if the death penalty does exist um, in, the, in the state that you're looking to operate, or, you know, a general sense of abolition, both being able to focus on federal and state level calls. There's, just, there's a lot of different ways to sort of like dip your toe in maybe. And that's the approach that we chose with the death penalty in kind of sight in the, with the site of like opening up to a bigger conversation about criminal justice reform. And I think that's, um, that works for us and, and works for our staff and customers. I think the way that Ben and Jerry's has gone to, you know, tackle the whole broken system um, is also, you know, I'll, I'll let Chris speak to, but, you know, and, and also a real thoughtful way of, thinking how do we have this conversation with the, um, the constituencies that we have. Yeah, yeah. Chris, Chris, I would love to take up that same question with you. You know, I think companies are involved in policy debates all the time. For better, for worse, corporations are, frankly, the most powerful entity in society, particularly at a time when our political system seems relatively um, unable to grapple with some of the biggest problems our society faces. Most of the time, corporations are using that influence behind the scenes uh, to advance policies in their own narrow self-interest, right? So it's tax policy, it's trade, trade policy, labor policy, et cetera. What we've seen in recent months is that citizens, consumers, people's expectations of companies' roles on these issues is changing. And increasingly, people are looking for corporations to be active participants in how we as a society wrestle with problems like the criminal justice system, public safety, etc. And so I think it's not a question of do companies that don't have a history or heritage like Lush or Ben and Jerry's have permission or can they get engaged on these issues? But I think increasingly it's going to be hard for these companies to stay on the sidelines. And so, you know, I think expectations are changing and I think, again, <laughs> I'm, it's, it's not necessarily a positive attribute, but brands and corporations connect with citizens and people in a pretty strong way. People have great affinity to brands that, that they like, that they admire. And, and so that then unlocks an opportunity for these brands to kind of connect with fans and consumers around these kinds of issues in a way that can advance change. But what we know, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've tackled some controversial issues over the years. We were one of the first companies back in 2016 to come out in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. We had, a, a, if I'm being honest with you, a fair bit of blowback from segments of society around that. It is also true that we've grown our business year over year for, for 42 years. We start, you know, a company started in a dilapidated gas station a mile from here. We're now in 40 countries around the world. So I think companies have a real opportunity to drive impact, but in so doing also help create, you know, what Ben liked to describe as, as these kind of bonds with, with, your consumer base around a shared set of values. And so I think increasingly people are going to be looking for companies to be a part of solving these problems. I'm going to, I'm actually on my other screen next to me is some of the findings of a, a, a data study that our friends at Porter Valley did recently. And um, to nearly two thirds of Americans say that it is no longer acceptable for companies to be silent on social justice issues. And more than half believe that companies that do not talk about social justice issues in their marketing and communications are out of touch. So I, you know, that tide is like, I think there's so much in what you're saying, Chris, that's true, that tide has turned. And in, in, in this same conversation, I want to encourage anyone listening to, um, to take a look at uh, the map of states that continue to use the death penalty and the map of states that use lynchings um, that, that, that lynched people. Um, and you'll feel a little bit sick when you do. Um, and I think that the death penalty is so much one of those issues that um, we will be judged as to which side of history we were on, on this. You know, even in the time that I started working on this issue, we've, we've seen 
quite an acceleration of states abandoning the death penalty, whether mm. that's legislatively or, or sort of through practice, or, you know, currently we have governors, Republican governors like in Wyoming, um, considering a moratorium on executions to, to put a kind of put the brakes on the death penalty. States like Ohio, where we have governors who have functionally put the brakes on executions and it needs to, I see you Kwame, and it needs to legislatively be over in the state of Ohio. Um, so, you know, I think that you're so true that the, the tide is turning and that, you know, we, we know that businesses are really critical at those tipping points. And, and we're more at a tipping point than people perhaps realize with the death penalty, especially in America. You know, we're, we're just nudging that 50-50 point of states that have effectively or, or, or officially abolished the death penalty. Um, we've only got a few more minutes to go, but Kwame, I want to address with you one of the toughest questions that we get. You know, I hear it. I'm sure you do. I want you to kind of put it to bed forever. Um, the question is, are there some people that deserve to get the death penalty? Hit it, Kwame. <laughs> so, um, no, there's not. And uh, the reason why is because, um, well, I could give you a litany of reasons. Uh, but I will stay with uh, the fact, um, keeping it politically correct, uh, that um, first and foremost, capital punishment is the instrument of depth uh, that was um, conceived by a, an administration that no longer exists even on the planet Earth, just period. Um, and that administration that once administered that um, death as a uh, practice of fun and a way to go out to on Friday nights, uh, we call the Coliseum today, uh, no longer practices that in their country. And in fact, every time that uh, another country announces or a city or state or providence announces that uh, they have dispensed with the death penalty, the lights in the Coliseum go on now in a good way. So that is the, the, the real barbaric reasons to why uh, it start as over. It shouldn't have never been started. Uh, if you come down to uh, the practicalities of the way we live and how you've heard um, both uh, Christopher Miller and uh, Colleen Packer speak on the fairness, the legality, fairness of it, you realize that uh, even in my case, which was over 50 years ago now, um, that uh, was almost 50 years ago, that um, it is so financially disbalanced that, and it happens to people who are financially uh, disenfranchised, or should we say embarrassed. It happens to people who have uh, high minutes on their skins. It happens to uh, certain areas to where the community in itself and its, its providence can afford to. Uh, here in Ohio, just last year, there was uh, eight people murdered uh, by some neighboring people. And uh, they were caught, they were checking the court and everything and no death penalty. Uh, yet, if you come up to Cleveland, Ohio, it could be one case and that one person will go to capital punishment simply because of the affordance of that community and its providence of being able to afford those million dollars spent. In a capital case, everybody involved has to be death row, uh, capital punishment, or however you want to say that, certified in the legal system. You can't just have a regular lawyer. Your lawyer has to be certified as a capital punishment lawyer. The prosecution has to be certified. The witnesses has to be certified. They have to be vetted. And that costs money, you know. And those numbers can go so far as to where one capital case can keep a person in jail 20 years, you know. And um, I just want to say, too, before I let you go, uh, that ill-placed uh, manner in which we want to go from the segue, or should I say, from capital punishment to slow death or LWAP or life without parole is also a, a real thorn in my side. And we'll be getting to that. Uh, and that's got to do with the community assessments that we're going to be making, because obviously um, there's some wrongdoings in that as well. Uh, so I just want to say that uh, I love you guys. I appreciate having uh, been again on um, the uh, project with uh, Colleen Packard uh, and Christopher Miller. I appreciate you uh, calling me out here uh, to say these things. Uh, I hope that I have represented both myself and my organization uh, to the best of my abilities. And um, 
anytime, guys. Okay, well, let's, I don't know if there's a better way to close out this panel than, than those words. And Kwame, thank you for sharing your story with us. And Colleen and Chris, thank you guys for sharing how that story and stories of this kind created a whole movement within your organizations and, and, and that work that your businesses did created change on the ground and shifted narratives on a really important and difficult topic.